Hi guys, so today I'm going to start filming my second video in my reading retelling series. In the first video of the series, I read Peter Pan for the first time and then I went on to read seven retellings and today I'm going to be reading Mulan. Now I found this edition online and it's five versions of the Chinese legend with related text. First thing I do to find retellings is I literally just do a Google search. I type in Mulan retellings Goodreads and then what that does is it brings up a bunch of list where books have been shelved into a Milan category. Then it's just a matter of going through each list, picking out the books that are listed most often because those books tend to be the ones that are the actual retelling. The thing is with these lists is they're kind of unreliable because I think anyone can add to them. Uh, there are definitely books that were listed in here that I knew for a fact weren't Milan retellings. The way I ended up narrowing down my selection was finding books where the author had directly stated that the book was inspired by Milan or it would say in the synopsis. It is commonly believed that Milan lived in 5th century AD. Milan was trained in skills of a warrior growing up. She had a younger brother and sister. However, her younger brother was too young to go to war in place of their father. That's why she did instead. The war Milan fought in lasted over 10 years. At the end of the war, Milan received great honors from the emperor for her service and she was offered a higher ranking role in the army. However, Milan declined this and instead returned home. I think this was part of the charm of Milan was she didn't go to war for fame or power or glory. She simply went there out of duty and love for her family and her father. For the entire time while she was at war and she fought alongside her fellow soldiers, they did not know that she was a woman. It wasn't until they visited Milan at her village after the war that they learned of Milan's true identity. Most Chinese myths and legends have a supernatural element to the story. What stands out about Milan is there is no supernatural element. It's simply a story of a girl putting on men's clothes to disguise herself as a man to fight into a war. And then at the end of that, she returns home and puts on her woman's clothes again. Just reach the halfway point on Dragon Rising. So we start off, we are following our Milan character. Her and her family are visiting her sister at the palace. Her sister is also married to the emperor and is not the empress. The emperor hasn't selected which of his wives is going to be the empress. If you are someone who cannot stand those YA protagonists that are like, I'm not like other girls, you won't like this because there is literally a sentence in like the first two chapters that says, I'm not like normal girls. So the very first chapter was very action-packed. There is an invasion and her sister is killed in that invasion. Our Milan character goes to war not just to replace her father in this but also to revenge her sister. An interesting difference in this book is that our Milan character and her family is said that they are a family that have dragon blood but that is a secret that they must keep. Not said why, just that it means they're special and if anyone was to discover this secret, the emperor will kill them. So this secret makes them an enemy to their own kingdom and to their own emperor. But we follow our Milan character, get her POV, and then we also get a second POV of the general who is also the busted brother to the emperor. You can already tell that it is heading into the direction that this guy is going to be the romantic love interest. Where I'm at in the story, Milan is at the training camp to prepare for war. In the first chapter, her family also got her to meet the man that they are hoping that she will marry and at this war camp they've met up and he knows that she's dressing up as a man to fight in the war and he's just kind of going along with it. I finished Dragon Rising. I was having fun in the beginning but I 
lost interest as the story went on. There was a lack of world building, a lack of character development, a lack of relationship development. It did become a bit around the romance. I mean, the romance didn't really happen, but you can tell that the author was giving a lot of time to those two characters that were going to develop a romance. This character's got dragon blood, her family has dragon blood. We don't really know what that means, but obviously, like I said, it makes them special. We learn more about this dragon blood as the book goes on. We get hints, and then in the big climactic scene, what that means comes to be revealed, and then the character has these magical abilities that she can use in that big climactic battle scene. The thing with this is I just felt like it took away the significance of the Milan story. You know, what's so powerful about Milan is she is an ordinary girl who doesn't have magical abilities, who can go to war and fight alongside the men. I said to you in my previous clip that this character literally said in like the second chapter that she's not like normal girls, and then to later on re-imply that through the reveal of her magical abilities and that being her strength. This just kind of says that, you know, girls can't accomplish, go to war and accomplish what men accomplish without having magical abilities. I'm reading into this a lot. I love my fantasy books and my magic in books, but there are times where I think that it's just as powerful to have a character that does not have magical abilities doing incredible things. <laughs> through reflection. Now this story takes place right after the avalanche scene in Milan. In that scene, Shang is injured and he's more injured in this book than he was in the movie. He's so injured that he's on death row. Milan has to travel into the underworld and there she makes a deal there with the king of the underworld to find Shang's ghost and if she brings him back before, it's either sunrise or sunset, I forget which one was part of the deal. Anyway, then he can come back to life but if she does not then he stays dead and she will be a prisoner of the underworld. A lot of the character building, the world building, the pretty much all the story building of Milan is not done and this book relies on the fact that you have seen the Disney movie. A lot of this book is taken from the movie. There are direct quotes. We are having like small flashbacks of scenes that we see in the movie. We are also having scenes recreated in a different way. I finished Reflection. I feel like I've said most of what I've thought about this book already in my previous clip. I thought this was a middle grade and in my head it makes sense that the Disney present books are middle grades but when I checked on Goodreads it's listed as YA so I don't know I mean who knows how reliable a Goodreads is anyway. I still really enjoy this though and I think it's a lot of fun and if you want an alternate story or if you want more from the Disney Milan story that we know I highly recommend this. <laughs> I'm a decent way through the flame of the mist now so I thought I'd give you guys an update. I loved the first two chapters of this. I was so drawn into the story. This story is more of a looser telling of Milan. It's set in Japan following the daughter of a prominent samurai and she is about to be married off to the second prince of the emperor. At the start of this book we are following her. She's in this carriage with the rest of her convoy. They are on their way to the palace but her convoy is attacked. Party of her convoy are all murdered but she escapes alive. He then goes on a little hunt to try and find down who attacked her. It's this group known as the Black Clan and she wants to find out why they attacked her to see if they have something against her family. With her marrying into the Emperor's family, her family's social status is increasing but she doesn't want anyone else to find out what happened to her and to know that she got lost in the woods because it could ruin her reputation and make her virtue be questioned. It could also be seen as a bad omen and they might not marry her. He also doesn't want to go back home to her family because she knows that they are just going to send her off to the palace again and she doesn't want to do that. She just wants to find out what's really going on. Mariko, the main character of the story, just we are connecting. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. I want to say that she's condescending but I don't know if that is the correct word that I'm looking for. There was a scene she's like I can't wield a sword like you know I'm just and then there are scenes where she thinks the complete opposite where she's like no I am strong I can do this. I guess what I'm trying to say is I find her character inconsistent with her thought patterns. I don't understand how she's flip flopping from being yes I'm a badass bitch I can do this to no no 
I can't do this. Which is why it's hard for me to get a full round picture of her character. Authors don't need to explicitly say why characters are doing what they do, but it should make sense in the storytelling because we should have enough delivery of the character development to get a sense of it. And we're not getting that from this. Where I'm at in the story, she ran away, got lost in the woods, kind of encountered this guy, then ended up getting picked up on the horse and carried away. And now she's with the Black Clan. So she just kind of fell in their laps, basically. She's disguised as a boy because she did run into this random guy that was just like wandering the forest. I don't know what he was up to. She killed him and she took his clothes. And now she's in the Black Clan and she's trying to suss out who hired them to sabotage her engagement and her family with her disappearing is sort of sabotaging her family and the engagement anyway so there's just a lot of stuff I'm questioning that doesn't make sense to me in terms of what's happening with plot and character choices and because I'm thinking so much about that I'm not able to focus on the story. I finished Flame in the Mist. I did like the world. The Black Clan they were an interesting group. I wasn't really sure what they were at first. They're like a mashup of a group of thieves and mercenaries. The one thing though and this is something else that didn't make sense to me was I didn't understand how they just took her in. She, she was a random stranger. Yes she was dressed up as a boy but they just took her in. Like I didn't understand why they would just do that. We also do get her brother's POV but I really would have liked to have his POV kind of developed their family a little bit more because his POV was focused on tracking down our main character and also a little bit on his love interest which I wasn't as interested in. I just think his POV could have been really interesting because there were things that were revealed later on in the story about her family and they were quite like political. I don't want to see too much because spoilers. The villain is revealed towards the end and it's one of those situations where we didn't find out much about the villain until they just like suddenly appear and we're like oh okay you were the villain I didn't really know you existed at all so it didn't really have any impact one of the members of the black clan is the main character's love interest and I did really like how he was pretty mysterious we slowly got to know his backstory but I would have preferred the pacing of their relationship to have slowed down a little bit I think that was my overall issue with this book like nothing was wrong about it the author was doing things and I just would have preferred them to be done in another way <laughs> I did start the second Elizabeth Lim book. I'm really enjoying this so far. We are following a girl who is the daughter of a tailor. She has three brothers. They have all gone off to war. Two of them died at war. One of them returned home but was injured and now has loss of mobility. Our protagonist's mother died when she was young. The father so affected by his grief that it affected his work. He is a tailor. He owned a tailor shop. He stopped working in it due to his grief and our main character took over his job. She's always had a passion for tailoring. Father falls more and more into his grief with the loss of his son. The emperor is looking for a royal tailor. Our protagonist's father is invited, but because of what's going on with him, and he hasn't been tailoring for a very long time. Well, she is going to enter the competition, but pretend to be her brother. So that's what's happening. I really like how it's kind of like a fairy tale aspect. Like I was immediately drawn into the story and I really liked how um, Elizabeth Lim introduced us to the main character and her family. I like how we had this time at the beginning to get to know the main character and to get to know her family. I just got to the halfway point and I didn't realize that this book, the first one third of this is at the court and is the competition, but then that's over. And now they're on a traveling journey. I can't say what, cause spoilers. There's a really interesting character in here that's really mysterious and he has magic. I'm guessing he's going to be the love interest. I have not finished Spin the Dawn. I didn't know what to expect, but I really loved how it ended up being kind of a road trip book. I love road trip books, especially in like fantasy settings. With the romance, it was slower to develop. I kind of wish that it didn't develop because I didn't really think the two characters had a whole lot of chemistry. But I liked that we got to know these characters before they were romantically involved and individually. I really, really liked them. But just not together. <laughs> I also really like that when it was revealed that our character was dressing up as a boy that it was pretty climactic. A lot of these other books I've read when the Milan character has been revealed to actually be a girl dressing up as a boy has been pretty anticlimactic which is fine because it wasn't a huge deal in the original but I just appreciated in the scenario that it was. I really like the magic in this and it was very fairy tale -esque. It was one of those magic systems where magic has a price. There is one character in this that is paying a heavy price. I really like that element. It's also one of those stories where the villain isn't really clear and cut. Like there are kind of multiple villains or people you could consider a villain. I overall loved this and I'm really looking forward to the second book. The only thing I wish was that there wasn't any romance or if there was a little bit more work on the two characters chemistry because I just didn't really feel it. I 
am three hours into the audiobook of The Hand, The Eye and The Heart. So this story, we are following a character called Zilan. Our protagonist is non-binary. This takes place in the Red Kingdom. What I like about this story though and what is different to the other Mulan stories that I've read is this is about gender identity. We do have a female emperor in this. I also like that there was this scene where they fought their father and then they got in a sense a blessing from their father to go to war on his behalf. Zalan also has magical abilities. The magic doesn't seem to have any other purpose other than to allow the protagonist to look like a boy. The other thing I'm liking that this story is doing that it is depicting the hardships that the soldiers go through. Like we're really feeling the pressure of their training and how they are grilled and their expectations and also them being very young and naive about what is to come. I really like that we had Zalan get period in this and they had to hide that. I finished The Hand, The Eye and The Heart. I started off really liking this. I liked the first fourth. I thought this was also a really interesting and different take because it was a modern take. We were really looking at gender identity. It was really about Zilan finding themselves and their gender identity and I thought the magic was an interesting touch because it wasn't a magic that played into the character's strength. It was just kind of there to aid the character and their identity. However, the plot got so convoluted. I don't even know what it ended up being about. I don't know, I just got really bored. Now when I finished it, I went to go and look up on Voices Reviews because the like, main character was non-binary but the way it read at times I thought they were gender fluid and I wasn't really sure so I wanted to go and form myself through on Voices Reviews. I came across a bit of a can of worms. I didn't realise that this book actually has a whole bunch of controversy. This author has been accused of cultural appropriation and the reason that it's a huge issue with this author in particular is because they have a history of of writing books with Asian main characters inspired by Asian mythology and this author is white. Now the reason this is an issue is because in the publishing industry when these stories are written by white authors and a person of colour who wants to write and own their own story with mythology from their culture and tries to sell it to the publishing industry, the publishing industry won't accept it and their argument is that that story already exists. For that reason they won't accept people of colour's own stories. So that's why Oasis books are so important and the publishing industry is just super racist. I found an article and I also found a really excellent blog post that goes into detail about the controversy surrounding this particular book and also expands upon the racism issue in the publishing industry and if I can work out how to link own voice and reviews from Goodreads I'll also leave them linked down below. Please read those articles and that blog post because it extends beyond this book. Like I said it's a publishing industry issue and I think it's really important that we all be informed. <laughs> So I'm a decent way through Magnolia Sword now. I'm loving this one. I'm really glad because this is the one I feel like is the most historically accurate or as close any of these books could possibly be. It is so evident how much time Sherry Thomas has put into her research and this is on Voices as well. Start off, Milan is from this small village and her family have this centuries old feud with this other family. You just know that each heir from each generation they have to have a combat battle for the feud. More of this comes to light as the story goes on. So when we're introduced to Milan, she's actually go setting off for this combat battle and she's all dressed up. Other family air that she is versing can't see her because she's all covered. And then we had the war come and one male from every family has to be constructed into the army and obviously Milan plans to go. In this though, Milan had a twin brother who died when they were children or babies. His name was never taken off the family registry so he's not registered as dead. Milan takes on his name in order to go to war and also she was raised as a warrior so her father was a warrior. She was also trained in combat. What I'm really loving about this is first of all, like I said, the attention to detail to the history, like I really feel like in this book, I'm in 5th century AD China. I'm really liking as well the realistic depiction of war, the way things are happening and the way the soldiers interact with one another. Again, you can just tell how much attention and research that Jerry Thomas has put into this. I think some people might find this a bit slow because it is a slow paced book. It reads like a historical fiction. Oh, one thing I will say though was there were some slurs used to describe a couple characters with disabilities. One had a physical disability and one had an intellectual disability. Okay, so I finished Magnolia Sword. I really, really enjoyed this. If you want a realistic Milan story, I recommend this because there was no addition of magic or any fantastical elements like a lot of these other books had. But the entire book is basically about the war and Milan's part in it. It does end up becoming more about that family feud that we were introduced to at the beginning and the character of the other heir who Milan had that combat fight with also 
came back into the story and was a large part of the story. This story is about honor, it's about revenge, it's about duty, it's about family and it's about forgiveness. I will say I also did a little bit of a look up on Shelley Thomas and she grew up in China and English is actually her second language which how do you write a book in a second language? I don't even speak a second language, that is incredible. I started The Warrior Maiden. I, I really don't know what to think of this book so far because it's set in Europe, but then this main character also has the name Mulan. I was like, hang on a minute, why is her name still Mulan when all these other characters have European names like Nikolai and Andre. It ends up being that this Mulan is adopted, so she's still Asian, but she's been adopted into this family. And apparently she said her name as a child, and so she named herself, and so that's why she's called Mulan. I don't know, I'm just thinking now about like cultural appropriation a lot and try to analyze it from that perspective. To be completely honest with you, I don't know how to think because we have an Asian main character in a European setting with an Asian story. So I don't know where that falls. This book is a little bit different as well in terms of Mulan isn't going off to war to save her father from going from, to war. Her father's actually dead. Her and her mother haven't reported that and they don't want to report it. It's something they need to keep secret because otherwise they're going to lose their property. Mulan goes to war in order to protect their property and also to protect her mother. We are also getting a second POV. We are following this guy called Wolfgang. All we really know about him is he has this strange relationship with his brother. He's also going off to war. So he's gonna end up being alone interest when he finds out that you know she's a she. One thing I will say I'm not loving is the way the narration is switching from Wolfgang to Milan. This could be the fault of the audiobook, there might be more of a break on the page but it's switching in mid chapters from like perspectives. Following that isn't exactly smooth. I finished The Warrior Maiden. Now the plot was all over the place. It started off having the typical Mulan story of her going off to war, fighting in this war that ends up being about the mother being on a witch trial and Mulan and Wolfgang trying to save her. It also ends up being a lot about Wolfgang and his estranged relationship with his brother and them coming back together. Please? I don't know, it was, it was just a really strangely structured, well, I guess I should say poorly structured plot. We also had the case of the romance taking over the story and like as soon as it was revealed that Milan was a girl, Wukang was like instantly attracted to her and you know Milan was instantly attracted to Wukang as soon as they met. The book ended up being a, a lot more about Wukang than it was about Milan. <laughs> I have also completed the final book that I'm going to be reading for this video and that is The Warrior Woman. This book is different to all the others because it's actually a memoir. I wanted to include this though because there weren't that many own voices books out there and I knew this was a memoir and that it wasn't going to be a direct retelling of Milan per se but Milan was going to be incorporated into the story. I thought you know it would be the best time for me to read this memoir now while I'm doing a Milan retelling video and I can tell you about it. I listened to the audiobook and I really wish I had brought myself a physical copy. It was at times a little bit easy to get lost in the story and what I mean by that is because it's a mix of myth and reality and it's hard to determine at times which is fiction and which is not um, which makes a really cool and interesting story just not a fantastic audiobook it's Maxine Kingston's memoir and it's basically her sharing her experiences as a Chinese American woman this memoir is broken down into five stories and each story focuses on a particular woman it's either a woman from her family or it's a woman from Chinese legend such as Milan so Milan's not a huge part of the story but she still is a character in here. This spark notes online for it. Each time I finish this chapter I've gone online and I've read the spark notes because I did get a little lost. This book I think was published in the 70s so it's a little bit older and unfortunately some of the terminology is very dated so there are racial slurs used to describe black people. There is also some fat phobia that's also included in this. Other than poor choice of terminology for some things I really enjoyed this. It's just a 
such an interesting mix of reality and mythology and it's such an interesting way to tell a story. It basically a story about a Chinese immigrant in America and it's also about women with a particular focus on Chinese women and the expectations that they have or don't have and how they are treated. There's a quote that really stood out to me that I just want to read out. It said, when you raise girls, you're raising them for strangers. When you think in terms of the treatment of women, not just Chinese women and how the Chinese treat their women, but throughout all of history, how women always seem to be as something to be given away and that's their value. That just said a lot. This was a really interesting book and there was so much to unpack. Okay, and that's it. So I'll wrap up this video now. I have a total of three favorites. I really, really, really love Spin the Dawn. I wouldn't say it's a close retelling of Milan. I think the only similarities is that we have a character disguising herself as a boy and doing something for her father. Although it was kind of more she was doing something for herself. I really loved the fantastical elements that were added to the story. And like I said, it was quite fairy tale esque And I think there were a lot of really interesting characters. And then I also really enjoyed Magnolia Sword. Now, if you want an accurate Mulan retelling, read this book. And then my last favorite is definitely The Woman Warrior. And I really liked how Maxine Kingston compared herself to Milan and her life to Milan's life. That's it. Thank you so much for watching. There'll be one of these videos coming out every single month until the end of the year for me. I have them all planned out. So I'm very, very excited. I hope you're excited too. Please let me know if any of these books I read you are going to pick up or if you have read them already, what did you think of them? Otherwise, I hope you're enjoying whatever you are currently reading and I'll see you next time. Bye!